from at the bottom, by the way, this blue, yellow, mm. and we're we're the primary colors. <laughs> Huzzah! Yeah. Very artistic. Okay, All now right. go. Creative insurgents. Creative insurgents. Hey everybody, this is Corey Huff with theabundantartist.com. And Melissa Dinwiddie with Living a Creative Life. And this is the Creative Insurgents Podcast. Where we are all about living a creative life according to your own rules. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> so Melissa, what's up? <laughs> how, how, are, how are things for you? Oh, well, things have been quite interesting. I had a radical, I just did a radical website complete redesign mm -hmm. in one weekend. Uh, and as you know, Corey, the reason is because I've been sharing my paintings on social media and people have been asking to buy them. So I got really motivated to get an e-commerce platform going on my website. I have one on my Ketuba site that works beautifully, mm -hmm. but I needed to install something on my Living a Creative Life site and the plugin that I wanted to use didn't work with my theme. So, oh, man. Yeah, but... but I'm so much happier with my site. I get to have my art all over it, and I, and I'm just thrilled. So check it out, MelissaDinwiddie.com. Awesome. Hey, I want to remind everybody uh, that you can get a free gift by going to the podcast website, CreativeInsurgents.com, and download downloading the Creative Insurgents Handbook, where you can get instructions on how to live a creative life on your own terms. Awesome. Beautiful. So, Melissa, why don't you introduce today's guest? Yeah, I am so excited to have Mark McGinnis with us today. Mark is a poet, and he makes his living, since poetry is usually not such a profitable career, he makes his, <laughs> <laughs> he makes his living as a coach for artists and creatives and entrepreneurs, and he runs a blog called Lateral Action, which offers tips and techniques to help you Focus on doing your remarkable things rather than spending all your time getting trivial things done and never moving beyond, beyond creative thinking, right? We want to be in creative action. And the real reason that I wanted to bring Mark on the show today and was so excited is that he's also the author of a wonderful book that I highly, highly recommend called Resilience, Facing Down Rejection and Criticism on the Road to Success. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just so delighted to get another chance to talk with you. Well, thank you, Melissa and Corey. It's, you know, we've been hanging out online for goodness knows how long now, so it's it's nice to, you know, get around the campfire with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of like our modern campfire here on Google Hangouts. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I have to I have to jump in and fanboy for a second. Mark, I've been reading your blog was one of the very first blogs that I started reading like 7 years ago. Um, oh no, you weren't reading then. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing to see, like, uh, you know, the way that your business has grown, and the and the direct and like the things you've done, and um, it, you know, I'm I'm a big fan. I'll just say that. So I'm really excited to have you. Uh, I pretty much just started a podcast so that I could get all of my favorite people in a room. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, quite the moment for me. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. That's very nice of you to say so. so. Well, I feel the same way, Mark. I'm a, I'm a huge, huge fan, and I absolutely love your book. Uh, as as we all know, if if you want to create original work and put it out in the world, you're going to have to learn how to deal with rejection and criticism. And yet, this is something that's so hard for so many of us, and it and it really paralyzes a lot of us. And I know, Mark, when I interviewed you previously, and you were sharing, and you share in the introduction to your book, Resilience, about how you came to write it. And I wonder if you'd be willing to share that story. Oops. Are we okay? Yeah, I can see you. You okay, so, Corey? You uh, yeah, Melissa, why don't you... Yeah, we lost you for a second. Why don't you go back to the beginning of that little segment? Oh, okay, okay. Yep. Uh, la, 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 okay. And what we're going to do is... 
Okay, we we do this neat little trick of uh, clapping into the microphone in the in the editing part of the video. You can see like the spike in the audio, uh, and that I shows you to steal that because I hate <laughs> editing audio. <laughs> and so when you're editing, sometimes I'll leave a gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but clapping is very the, cool. Yeah, that's what the guys at Fizzle.co taught me. Smart. Yeah. I'm learning all. I'm learning all. The, learning all the pro tricks today. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm trying to remember where I. Let's see. Where did I? Where did you we were all the way back? Uh, why don't we just go into you write creativity and productivity equals success? I I and I, I jumped down below that, but okay. Oh, okay. Why don't I? Um, just start there. Okay. Or whatever. So, Mark, uh, you write on your blog, you have this great little formula, creativity plus productivity equals success. And yet, so many creatives get mired in resistance, right? And one of mm -hmm. my sayings is that if you want to be prolific, which of course we, do, we all do, right? The simple formula is imperfectionism plus effort plus time equals prolificness. And I'm curious, since I know that you write so much about crea creativity and productivity, what are some of your go-to tips for charging up both creativity and productivity? Well, really, I mean, for me, I would put creativity and productivity together. You know, it's creating, actually producing. Creating is producing something. But not just productivity as in the usual uh, productivity cranking widget industry because none of us here and listening to this are, are in the business of cranking widgets we want to create something amazing so for me if you really want to be creative and productive in in the best sense then it's about number one do something that you really are passionate about and probably that will scare you a bit too that's usually a good litmus test you're really excited and also a bit scared it keeps you awake at night thinking can I really do this Number two, dedicate time to it. You know, if even if it's only half an hour a day, or you know, depending on your work schedule. Sorry, I can't say schedule. <laughs> um, <laughs> you just say an hour, two hours, five hours, whatever it is. Say that is the time I'm going to do this, because number three, you've got to expect resistance. And I find that if you say so, this this is my writing time or my painting time or, or whatever it is and then the time comes there will be temptations to do other things but if you've said okay this is the time then you know you're either doing it or you're making excuses not to do it it takes away a whole level of decision making and yeah. you know paradoxically the more you accept okay oh, all right this is resistance that urge to go on Facebook again that urge to check email again <laughs> to make another cup of tea or coffee or whatever it is you just think oh that's resistance that's what it is. So I just need to ignore it and open up the document or get the guitar out or or whatever it is and just get going. Absolutely. I, I cannot agree more. And to, to your first point of the three, um, I think so many people suffer under the illusion, I know I did for so many years, that if it's hard and I'm feeling that resistance and I can't seem to get myself to do it, that that just that's a stop sign that that means I should quit and in fact I now know that 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 is a hallmark that that fear that I don't think I'm ready that I just don't think I can do this whatever that's a hallmark that that's exactly that's a, that's my calling that's exactly what I need to be doing and really the most important the most important thing any of us can do in order to achieve our goals of success in anything is to get comfortable with discomfort because there's always going to yeah. be that discomfort we're always going to be pushing up, up against some kind of resistance when we're endeavoring to do something that's important to us right yeah yeah which is the kind of the mirror image of the uncomfortable comfort zone as my friend Kathleen calls it that's great when you're not you're not doing what you know you really want to be doing Yes. You know, you're you're on Facebook instead, or you're on the the sofa instead, or doing any number of other things that may look worthy or productive or not, but it's not what you want to do in your heart of hearts. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great point. 
Well, I know one of the things that also gets in people's way really big time is fear of rejection, fear of criticism. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you want to create original work and you want to put it out in the world, you're going to have to learn how to deal with it because the more you put yourself out there, the more you're going to be getting feedback, both positive and negative, right? And you have yeah. this fantastic book that you've written, and you have this great introduction to your book about how you came to write it, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share that. Sure, um, because it was the last thing I was thinking of writing. So I, I, one of the things on my website is a free course for creative professionals. It's kind of creative career guide called the Creative Pathfinder, and you sign up and you get a lesson a week. It was supposed to be for 25 weeks, and it covers creativity, productivity, networking, marketing, managing money, all, all the kind of basic stuff that we have to do. And towards the end, I thought, oh, I guess I should say something about rejection and criticism. So, I'll, And I thought, will I make that a bonus lesson? I thought, no, I'll, I'll just put it in. You know, be, So it's, it's 26 weeks, which is a kind of a bit of an odd number. And at the end of the course, I asked people to, to vote which were the most which was the most valuable lesson for you. And by a country mile was the one about rejection <laughs> and criticism, which was the last one that I, I just put it in almost as an afterthought. And I was getting emails from people saying, you know, you could write a book about this. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I could write a book about this. <laughs> so I don't always write stuff that comes from the audience but in this case it was loud and clear and also because it made me realize what you you said earlier on which is yeah we all have to deal with rejection and criticism you know if you are gonna put your work out there into the world you can't control how the world responds to it and it just made me realize I've been coaching for years and years and in just about every client I've worked with rejection and or criticism have come up. So I realized, oh, I've been solving this problem for years without ever really treating it as a separate issue. And, it, you know, I had a look and it seemed nobody had really had written a book about, I mean, there's, there's books on romantic rejection and dealing with criticism in, in the workplace, but I couldn't see anything, particularly for creatives, about rejection and criticism together. So mm -hmm. I thought, hey, we need to, we need to tackle this. Yeah. That's fantastic. Oh my gosh, so like the whole idea of rejection and criticism, right, like it, um, even just thinking about it, I get emotional about it, like mm. I can feel, I can feel my heart racing and I can feel myself, like, breathe, like my breathing is getting heavier, um, you know, I, as an actor, I face far more rejection than I do acceptance. Mm -hmm. right? Like I walk into right. an audition room and the odds are that I'm not going to get the part. Like that, <laughs> you know. Like I think, I think my ratio is like one out of every seven or eight auditions, I get a callback. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's um, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good ratio, but it's still <laughs> yeah. tough to go through it. Yeah. Um. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a professional now, and I and I pick I sort of pick and choose the auditions that I go to. But even being choosy about it, you know, and and trying to only audition for parts that I know are right for me, it's still it's still tough. You know, yeah. there was. Uh, just a few months ago, there was a part that is one of those lifetime roles. Like I, I desperately, desperately want to do this, and I'm quickly becoming too old to do it. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 I was one of the final actors called in for it, and uh, I didn't get it. And it, it's tough to pick yourself up off the mm -hmm. floor and keep going. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you have to, right? Like you, you have to. It's just part of part of the creative process. So Mark, how, what, what would you suggest to somebody like in, in Corey's position who has to deal with re rejection as part of their creative work over and over and over and over again and if, yeah. if, if Corey's not able to manage that there's no way he can be an actor because you have to audition and you have to be, you're, you're going to be rejected. Yeah. yeah. Well, Corey's already doing the number one thing, which is just keep putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Because even if you do nothing else, just the fact that you experience it multiple times, you should at least get used to it and realize, okay, it might feel like life and death, but it isn't actually. And you realize it's, it's more of an occupational hazard. 
than anything. Except, <laughs> accept the pain and it can no longer hurt you. Right. <laughs> or that's something. It. And, and also, no, but I, I actually think this is, this is true because how many times do we hear from people, usually who are not artists or actors or poets or whatever themselves, saying, don't take it so personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I mean, how easy is it to, to follow that? Because as Corey's just shown us, even we do take it personally because we put our heart and soul into it. It isn't just... I, I got a really, found a really nice quote from the novelist Gustave Flaubert. He said, we take a length of gut from our bellies and serve it up. Mm -hmm. so then, then the bourgeoisie get their knives out. <laughs> of course it hurts. <laughs> and so I think it's, you know, and it, I, I see people go, oh, well, I shouldn't take it so seriously. It's silly and whatever. Well, of course you should. I mean, you put everything into it. It's going to hurt. And in, without being too, um, uh, what's it, drill sergeant-ish about it, it should hurt. Because if mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt, then you're not, you're just phoning it in. You're not putting your heart and soul into it anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. But the paradox is, as Corey said, you know, if you accept the pain, it will sting, but it won't sting quite as much. Yeah. Well, regarding um, criticism, one of the things that I have learned over the years is that have you ever noticed that when somebody lobs a criticism bomb at you, Sometimes it hurts like hell, right? And sometimes it's like whatever it it whatever they're saying it's like okay. For example, um, okay, so this is sort of a silly example, but when I remember in you know how kids can can be so mean in labeling other kids and giving them nicknames that are mm. nasty, right? Well, my last name, Dinwiddie, some boys decided they wanted to make fun of me, and so they tried out calling me Dumb Witty. My, there's no M in my right. last name, but, right. you know, Dinwiddie, d Dim Witty, Dim, or Dim, first I said, you're a Dim Wit, you're a Dumb Wit. Well, it didn't bother me, because I always did really well in school. So right. that, you know, you know, Melissa's a dummy, Melissa's Dim Witted, or whatever, that didn't, it was annoying, <laughs> but it didn't like rip me yeah. apart because it. I didn't have a trigger point there. Yeah. But yeah. boy, you know, if somebody says something that touches on an area that I feel really insecure about, ooh, you know, that's it. Watch out! I'm flattened for days, mm -hmm. and just knowing that. And knowing that if you're hit by a criticism and it flattens you, it must be touching on a, a trigger point, you know, it pushing your big red button, right? So there's right. something there that you fear is true about yourself, that when somebody mm -hmm. throws that criticism at you, it just hooks right into yeah. that. Yeah. And just knowing that has helped me be able to detach myself from getting hooked like that. Hmm. What else? It's a really good clue to what what the unconscious thinking is that's behind that. You know, if you're saying right. on some level I fear this about myself and then, you know, if that's some level maybe fairly far down until it gets brought to the surface by, you know, some kind of criticism. Well, yeah, it's not nice, but it's also an opportunity to say, so, whoa, I didn't realize I was thinking that. Is that yes. really true? And you can kind of get the hood up on it and examine it and, and maybe say, well, okay, time to throw away that that assumption or that idea. Exactly. So in that way, what, what can be so cool about criticism, it, like who wants to be criticized, right? Nobody likes that. But it can actually be a really powerful tool for self-growth and, ex, you know, expanding beyond our limitations for potentially, ourselves. Potentially. Potentially. It's always easier to see that in, in other people. <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely true. Well, um, I know you mentioned before about m the importance of making the time, and that uh, I've discovered as well. Uh, I, I spent probably about a decade saying to myself, um, oh gosh, I wish I had time to make my art. I wish I had time to make my art instead of always being yeah. stuck making art for clients. And it wasn't until years later that I finally realized, oh, it's not a matter of having the time. It's a matter of making the time. Um, so yeah, you, you, and you write about that in a book that you also contributed to manage your day-to-day. 
build your routine, yeah. find your focus, and sharpen your creative mind. And uh, you write about your the the single most important change that you can make in your working habits, which is to switch to your creative work first and what you call yeah. your reactive work second. Can you yeah. can you explain what that means? Yeah, I mean, years ago, I used to think, well, I get up in the morning and I'm, I'm going to get on with, usually for me, it's a piece of writing. And I would be really excited, and then I would th I'd think, well, okay, but before I get down to work, I better just clear the desk. Just check email, and if there's anything <laughs> needs attending to there, I'll deal with that, and then I'll re return the phone calls and I'll just go through the to-do list, the things that could be from yesterday's meeting, and it gets to five o'clock, and I've done everything but the one yeah. piece that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I realized this was not getting me anywhere. This I was just on the hamster wheel. It was just, and anyone could ring up at any point, and I would go, all oh, right, yeah, okay, let me get on to that. Or an email could come in, and that would be another half hour gone. Yeah. And... So what I decided to do, and it was really uncomfortable at first, was say, so first thing in the morning, I'm going to do what I think is the biggest priority. I'm going to sit down and do the writing, email off, Twitter off. Well, I don't think there even was Twitter in those days, but whatever it was, <laughs> was turned off. I wasn't answering the phone. It was going to answer phone. And it was really uncomfortable because some, you know, there was always that feeling that somebody somewhere was wanting me to get back to them about what they thought was mm -hmm. the biggest priority and you, you just have to go through that wall of anxiety I think and say yeah. no I'm, I'm gonna do this today and actually that that was the start of me really starting to move forward on my writing and, and producing stuff that I was pleased with that I was putting up on the web initially now publishing in print as well and it was all the you know the writing the blog the making the you know the pathfinder lessons writing my books these are all the things that a i'm most proud of in terms of you know creating content for the business but they're also things that have added the most value to my business you know they mm. bring me you know stuff that i wrote years ago brings me new clients and yet it's all the stuff that Nobody was that, you know, and people are always impressed once you've done it. They say, Oh, isn't it great? You wrote a book. <laughs> I'm like, Where were you when I was trying to write it? And I was, you know, <laughs> but of course, you have to do it on your own, you know. But I would say, if anybody's listening to this and thinking, Oh, but I just don't have the time, just think, Well, if you make the time, yeah, even five, ten minutes a day on your commute in the, the notebook on the back of another commuter's back, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Something you, you can find something, and it was really brought home to me. I listen. I was listening to the Poetry Foundation's podcast a few months ago, and they had a uh, an American poet was there talking about Gwendolyn Brooks, the great um, poet from the mid twentieth century, and and Brooks was her mentor, and and she went to see Brooks one day, and and Brooks said, so you know, how's how's your writing going? And she, she, I can't, I, I should remember the poet's name, I can't remember her name, but she, she, was, she was looking for sympathy. She was going, well, you know how hard it is with work and family and studies. And, and she was looking for the, oh, poor you. And Brooks looked at her and said, you shouldn't have time for anything else. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, that's quite, that's quite hardcore. But then that's you pretty look at what she achieved, <laughs> and it's, that's what it takes. It's quite though. remarkable. Now, yeah. I probably wouldn't go that far myself. I mean, you know, I might put the kids, say, you know, <laughs> not higher on. But actually, it really does challenge you to think, well, what are you making time for? Yeah, absolutely. What, what are your real priorities, in other words? Do you really want this, or do you just kind of say you want to do it as a hobby and it would be nice to have done it? Yes. Yeah. I like to say uh, my motto is, the, the thing I do first is the thing that gets done. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 We Absolutely. all have the same amount of time every day, and it's not like like the people who do amazing things with their life. They have the same amount of time in their day as we do. Like we all get yeah. 24 hours a day. We all have to sleep relatively the same amount of time. Um, you know, like is it uh, Gogon, the artist Gogon? He became a full time artist when he had a career as a stockbroker and was married with two kids. Like. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. I can't even imagine uh, what that's like. Well, in 15 minutes a day is what launched 
my most creative, uh, prolific output ever. Back in mm -hmm. 2011, I made a, a commitment to making art just 15 minutes a day. I could go beyond that if I wanted, but mm -hmm. my minimum commitment for one month it was 15 minutes, and that turned into uh, over 150 pieces that year. So, <laughs> really, you know, mm. it's just the commitment to make some. I, actually, I encourage people to make the their commitment a ridiculously achievable one. Whether it's 15 minutes or 250 words or filling in a three by five card, whatever, something yeah. so that you're making movement forward. If you do that, you know, nothing will stop you. Well, it's again. I'm I'm thinking about William Carlos Williams. You know, one of the great poets of the 20th century wrote lots of these really quite short poems, and apparently the one of the reason for that is that it was about the size of the notepad, the doctor's notepad on his <laughs> desk, and he would write these things in between patients. <laughs> that's great. That's so that. I think that's pretty cool. You know, that it was just <sighs> form following the form following the function of the doctor's pad. Fantastic. Well, boy, we we have touched on a lot of great little gems here and really wonderful tips for creativity and producing your your creative whatever your creative expression is. Um, it's been so great to talk to you, Mark. I'm just delighted to get a chance to hang with you today. Well, my pleasure. Likewise, the two of you. You're both doing amazing stuff it's it's always good to see what you're putting out there in the world so it's very nice to be along here for for part of the ride well thanks for joining us and where where can people find you mark uh, lateralaction.com is my creativity and coaching site and if anyone's interested in my poetry and my thoughts on poets and and poetry it's markmcginnis.com and that's Perfect. mcginnis with double n e double s and we'll Great. put that on the on the page for the podcast as well, on the show yep, notes. Right. Yep. Mark, thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you.